And we are back for more Hockey Talk on the Prime Sports Radio Network. Yes, Tyler Toffoli is a Vancouver Canuck. Mr. Jan Levine. And uh, how about I, that, huh? I, I heard the trade, and the first thought was <laughs> I need to let Greg know because oh, yeah. he's going to be jumping up and down. I couldn't jump up and down because um, I was already in bed, but I would have if I wasn't in bed. I was all tucked in. I just finished watching the end of the Daytona 500, which upset me because I actually had more money on Ryan Blaney than I did on uh, Denny Hamlin, so I wasn't happy about the finish. I went to bed a little bit dejected, and then I get a text from Jan, and I see it say something about trade and Toffoli, and, and knowing you, it could have been anybody because you would have just told me that Toffoli got traded even if it wasn't to Vancouver. So I had no idea. I was like, this better be to Vancouver. And it was, and I was shocked because these things usually don't happen to me. Yeah, most of the time I'm telling you trades, it's usually going to Vancouver or going to the Rangers, and I would have told you if he was going elsewhere besides Vancouver. So, yes, Toffoli is probably – Probably the biggest name that has gone so far in the trade market, though, as, as we'll get to, the trade market has been kind of hot lately and makes you wonder if this is the tip of the iceberg and Monday is going to be a dud. Monday is going to be phenomenal, I mean, I'm sorry, or this is like the end all and be all and it's going to peter out. I have a feeling the next several days leading up to 3 p.m. on Monday are going to be a little bit crazy. So, look, the reason why when we talked about uh, Toffoli in Vancouver a few weeks ago, the, the only player that I told you that I wanted, in the, in, this was my top priority. Uh, there's a bunch of other names in the Vancouver market that they talked about for the last few weeks, including Toffoli, but this was the only player I wanted. I just think he's the perfect fit for their team. I think he fits in perfectly as far as – you know what he can do not only with scoring goals but just i think he's he's a travis green type of player uh you know he does a great he does a great job of controlling possession shots all that kind of stuff Uh, whether he winds up playing with pearson his bestest buddy in the world uh along with horvat which will be in my mind eventually what will happen when bezer comes back when bezer comes back bezer will go to the number one line for sure and then they'll move Toffoli to the number two line, I would imagine. The thing that I'm concerned with, though, is that Toffoli apparently is going to start with the first line, which means more Erickson with the second line. I'm not happy about that, but I, I just got a feeling that Toffoli will probably skate initially with the first line, but knowing Travis Green, he's going to juggle the first couple of lines for a game or two to find out what fits best. Well, I mean, first of all, I think you need to change your when to an if because that depends on when um, um, Vancouver still remains in the playoffs or playoff contention uh, because Besser is out at least three, likely eight weeks with the rib injury. Mm -hmm. So there's no guarantee he's making it back uh, before the end of definitely before the end of the regular season. And if that depends and the depends on, on whether or not. If Vancouver is in the playoffs or not, if he actually makes it back for the first round, and even then, it still has to be questionable given that time frame. So, part of part of the rationale for them acquiring Toffoli at a fairly significant price. Uh, you and I were talking about this. You knew it wasn't going to be Podkolzin. You knew it wasn't going to be Hoglander. Madden was likely the next best prospect that they had, and it's a decently significant cost to give up along with it too to get Toffoli. But with Besser out with a desire for Jim Benning to help make the playoffs with the hope that you'll re-sign to Foley and the kind of combinations you mentioned, potentially him being paired with Pearson who made up the seven line sevens line with Jeff Carter when LA won the title, all that factored into Vancouver being mildly aggressive to say the least in terms of going out and acquiring him in terms of lines. I do think he'll end up on the second line, but with Besser out, you have a wing and a top six wing that's no longer there. So you have to kind of plug holes as best as you can, and Toffoli now is plugging one of the holes that's left by Besser's absence, and somebody else is going to fill the role that Toffoli would have filled if, assuming Besser had been healthy and hadn't been sidelined. Yeah, look, the best is is that Jake Vertanen plays well enough that he can stick with the first line, and Toffoli can go into that second line. I think what they're worried about is is that Vertanen hasn't been playing as well over the last week or two on the first line, and so he wants to strengthen the first line. But like I said, what that does is that moves Vertanen to the third line, and then Erickson stays on the second line, which is, to me, a complete waste of time. 
You know, he, he, he does all the nice little things, but that line just will not score enough goals to be an effective line with him on it. So I hope until Bezer comes back, Vertanen can find a way to get back to that first line. You move to Foley to the second line, and I think you get a much better situation uh, until Bezer comes back. So, Agreed. I, I don't think Erickson's – from what we've seen, Erickson doesn't look like he's got a whole heck of a lot left, no. and he'd probably be better off on the third line at this point in time and, and put more of a scoring winger up in your top six to go along with and, Foley. And I think I heard Tyler Mott supposed to return tonight, which is really an underrated – player for them on that fourth line uh he really is the best fourth line player they have so uh I, good to see him back because the fourth line has suffered without him as well over the last couple of weeks and uh by the way as far as prospects are concerned i would have put madden as far as forwards i would have put him as the fourth best forward prospect behind cole lind so i i have cole lind third uh, madden, uh, madden fourth and then, of course, the others, the others, you have Joe Levy, you have Wu, you have Rafferty, you have DiPietro. So Madden was somewhere in that top seven, eight, probably the third or fourth top forward. But look, when you've got Madden's a center, and I know centers can play anywhere, but when you have good debt, when you have Pedersen, uh, and uh, when you have Horvat, you've got your top three centers for the next five or six years. You don't absolutely need to keep all of your prospect centers that's what they're there for not only to make your team but also to trade and that's why when you build up your farm system the way benning has done over the last several years this is the luxury that you get to trade one of these pieces to bring back these types of players and by the way i believe this was also made to resign him next year if they lose him they lose him but they want to resign him next year. And I think Toffoli, as long as he enjoys himself and they have a nice little run in the playoffs, he's got his best buddy there, he likes it in Vancouver, I think if they could fit him under the cap, they'll resign him. I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I, I think there is a strong likelihood that they go ahead and resign Toffoli. Likely probably, a, probably about a two, three-year deal is my estimate. I don't know if I'm going long-term on him based on age and everything else. Um, but but they're definitely giving him a multi-year contract to kind of fill a top six wing role on your team. Okay, now the Rangers also made a trade, not a blockbuster. It was a prospect trade. So talk a little bit about the prospect swap uh, with Joey Keane going to Carolina for uh, Gauthier. Is that how you pronounce his name? Gauthier? Yeah, Joey Gauthier. Gauthier. Okay. Julian Gauthier. So, I mean, Rangers are dealing from a position of strength to a certain extent. Uh, you know... What we've seen out of Adam Fox this year as a rookie, uh, they have Reg they have uh, Yego Rykov in the system. They have Libra Hayek in the system. That's those are the those are the lesser guys probably at this point in time. Then you have Nils Lundqvist who was a first round pick a couple of years ago. You have Andre Miller who was a first round pick a couple of years ago. You have Matthew Robertson who was I believe a second round pick last year. So so the Rangers have a fairly substantive defensive pipeline. Uh, they are lacking to a certain extent in forwards and ready-made for the NHL right now, kind of forwards. They have, you know, they have Kraft, Vitaly Kravtsov, who's likely going to be up. Capo Kako is already here. Um, they have a cup. They have, you know, um, Morgan Barron, who's a big guy who they drafted out of Cornell very late a couple of years ago, who may go pro this year. So they have a couple of good prospects in the minors, but they don't have ready-made ones. And what Gautier gives them is a big winger. He's skilled in terms of scoring in his shot, tons of speed. Physical is about 6'4", 225. Uh, not necessarily the greatest of passers. Needs to work on his defense, though he's fairly good on the penalty kill. They brought him in because he is a guy who can fill a role now. And with all the rumors that Chris Kreider could get dealt or Jesper Foss could get dealt, Gautier could end up with the parent club immediately. He's actually in Chicago with the team now skating, though no guarantee he gets in the lineup tonight. So they fill a need by, by importing a forward and one ready for the NHL now who's a big body that can also play in front. For Carolina, one, uh, they might have lose, lost Gautier as an RFA after the season, so they were protecting their assets. B, in Keene, they get an asset who was drafted only last year, so they have him under control for several more seasons before they need to worry about what his contract status is. He does give them a fairly solid defenseman to go along with the pipeline of D-men they have. Uh, he probably may have topped out a little bit this year. He really took a quantum leap forward this season in, in Hartford, a... A scoring defenseman, maybe not as good defensively as he is offensively, but one who took a major step forward, can run the power play, has a decent amount of speed in terms of going you know, from, from offense to defense and vice versa. 
What he does is he gives Carolina an asset that is retainable for slightly longer than Gautier, who got a cup of coffee with Carolina but was never able to stick. So both teams fill needs. The Rangers, though, may have felt a little bit of a broader need and may have brought in a player that has a bit more overall upside than what they gave up in the Keen for Gautier swap. And uh, over the weekend, uh, the winning streak came to an end. Uh, the Rangers did well on the road, uh, come back home, take on Boston at the Garden on Sunday and lose to uh, one of the best teams in the league, the Boston Bruins. Yep, 3-1 loss. Uh, didn't play great. Um, Boston did a very good job of squashing them. The neutral zone didn't, didn't give them a lot of room offensively. Took advantage of two mistakes um, or two misplays, depending on how you want to view it, in scoring uh, both of their goals. One of them came shorthanded on uh, Truba not being able to handle the puck at the line. The blue line and Charlie Cole came in on a breakaway. Uh, the second one was more of a knuckle puck that went off uh, Ranger defenseman skate, ticked off a Truba, and then fluttered in over uh, Alexander Georgiev's glove in the, at the end of the first period. That, that was completely uh, but they got one back. But, uh, that, I mean, that was... Oh, uh, completely fluked. But, but one that should have probably been caught by, by him. I think he was just fooled by the by the rotation <laughs> of the puck for some reason. And then Zibanejad got a goal to make it 2-1 midway through the third on the power play. Uh, but they weren't able to get the equalized. They actually had a pretty good shot about four minutes later. Um, Kako set up uh, Di Giuseppe in front, and, and Halak made, it, Yaroslav Halak made a very good pad save. And after that, they really didn't generate a ton. Um, but uh, and, and Boston was able to hold on and then got the empty netter with about 18 seconds left. But really, it was a one-goal game for the last 10 minutes or so of the third. Uh, a pretty competitive game. New York gave, I wouldn't say gave Boston all they can handle, but they were clearly right in the game with 2-1 contest. Um, that was up in, up in the air and, and the, you know, the result in the balance until the end, even after they pulled the goalie, but they weren't able to generate any attack down the stretch. All right. Uh, the, one of the other teams at the Rangers, uh, of course, they have a very big uphill battle if they want to get into playoff contention, the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, they, you know, I, I like what I've been seeing out of the Flyers. Of course, they have a hot goalie. Anytime you have a hot young goalie, well, I shouldn't even say hot. He's really just a good goaltender. He's been hot ever since he's uh, been up and uh, ever since he was called up last year. Um, but you have that. That was always the difference. We talked about that for years with the Flyers. You know, the, the same old retreaded older guys <laughs> they kept throwing in there. Uh, and how many times we talk about them needing to trade for a goalie or develop one well, now they have this kid heart. So now I feel, okay, St. Louis did it with Bennington, and maybe Philadelphia could do it with heart, but that would mean the Flyers would have to add a few more pieces at the deadline. I'm not so sure they can do that. You tell me. But I do like them in the mix. I added them this week in my future portfolio at 30 to 1. So I think when you take a look at the other teams that are in that, you know, between 20, 20 to 35 to 1, I think they're, they're one of the better teams right now, which is the reason why I decided to take them. What do the Flyers have to do to actually make a run? Uh, well, getting Carter Hart back from his mild injury helped. I mean, Brian Elliott really did a good job of, you know, keeping them in games, um, getting hot at the, at the right time. So it gives them a nice one-two duo if they need it. James Van Riemsdyk, who's been very streaky, is back on another hot streak. I do think they need another scorer. They've tried Morgan Frost for a bit. Joel Farabee is up right now. He's in a, he's in a top six, top nine role. We've seen what Giroux can do. Um, on the blue line, Shane Gossespierre has really been a major disappointment. He's battling an injury now. But if, if, if Philly's going to do anything, one, I do think they need another blue liner and probably a top four, which is not going to be easy to acquire. And then if they can get another, another winger. Um, you know, connecting has been great this year. Travis connecting has taken a step forward. We know what Giroux, you know what Voracek can do. Um, but they do, I think, need one more winger and potentially one more blue liner. But as you said, if you have a good goalie, and Hart has shown that he's a good goalie, um, they could, they should be able to hold on to the wild card spot, um, especially now that Columbus has really hit the skids. I mean, injuries have wreaked havoc on that team. Now without Seth Jones, probably for about another six to seven weeks or so, um, you're without... Cam Atkinson, again, for about another two weeks. Um, Elvis Merzlikens has been great, but the loss of Jones is, is huge. I mean, you, you can't make up what he gives you for 25 minutes a game, especially when he's paired with Zach Wierenski. And Wierenski can only do so much, and they have other guys in the pipeline who are decent defensemen, but nowhere near at the level of Jones. So Philly should have a leg up on, on, on Columbus right now, uh, despite the great job that John Tortorella has, has done this season. 
with all the injuries that continue to mount. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And uh, that's another reason why I was thinking Philly might be able to move past Columbus and Carolina, too, because the, the, the Dookie Hamilton injury uh, is just another big blow to this type of a team like Columbus that lost key personnel in the offseason. But uh, Carolina is also losing a very key player that doesn't look like now he's going to return from what we hear uh, at least to the end of the regular season with Carolina, that could mean until next year. That could be. That could be. Uh, although, you know, they've gotten really good play out of Morazic and Reimer, Peter Morazic and James Reimer between the pipes. Though Reimer has probably taken over, the taken over the number one job, but losing Hamilton was huge. But you know, you look at what Sebastian Aho has done. You look at what Ter- Tiva Teravainen has done. Um, you have balanced scoring around them to a certain extent. Justin Williams came back and has given them a boost. Um, defensively, yes, losing losing Hamilton is huge, um, which is why you're seeing making the move for Keane, and you wonder if Keane could get a cup of coffee for that team at the end of the season. Uh, but Carolina does have the guys up front to potentially make a run or at least have a shot at getting into the playoffs. You sort of wonder as to whether or not they're going to go out and, and acquire something and a something small. I don't know what if, if that's going to be the route that they go, especially given what we've seen so far in the marketplace. But if they want to have a shot at making the playoffs, I do think they need to import maybe one more bottom pair blue liner. And, of course, getting like maybe a bottom six forward to augment what they currently have might not be the worst idea either. As far as the other trades that took place, there were a lot of trades uh, since the last time we spoke. Uh, let's talk about the probably the biggest one outside of Toffoli um, might have been could have been Washington getting Dylan. You know, because they're such a top team, Washington, right now. Matter of fact, they are the they're a co fourth choice uh, with Colorado and Dallas at nine to one. I actually put more money on Washington this week because of that. Uh, but they get Dylan for a second and a third. Good move. Good move. A solid defensive defenseman. Another big body that likes to hit. Um, you look at the guys that they already have. I think they have five of the top ten in terms of hits in the NHL. So when you play against Washington, you know you're going to have a physical battle. They definitely needed a blue liner. Um, you have Kepney. We know how good John Carlson has been. He may end up winning the Norris Trophy this year. Um, you have Goodus. You have other guys on that team. But Dylan brings another a second line, second pair element who can play the penalty kill, lengthens the defense, takes some of the pressure off of John Carlson. You know what kind of season Ovechkin has had, although he's, he hasn't scored, I think, in five games as he tries for number 700. He's a 698. T.J. Oshie's had a resurgence. We know how good Backstrom can be. They're dealing right now with a banged up of Jenny Kuznetsov, though he may be back fairly soon. So you look at Washington, if Braden Holpe can, can play like Braden Holpe has, and if Samson, Ilya Samsonov rebounds from the mild slump that he's going through, they're going to be fine between the pipes, and they have the experience of having gone through and won a cup two years ago. So they're, they're one of those teams, as you mentioned, that probably should be a favorite to come out of the, come out of the East. Uh, although the East right now, may be considered even more loaded to a certain extent oh, in the yeah, West absolutely. is based upon how top-heavy oh, yeah. it is. And with Holpe, he proved a couple of years ago that he only needs to get hot during the playoffs uh, as he yep. didn't even start that playoff year as the number one goalie. Uh, all right, so the other trade that might have been considered a, the biggest one this past week was the Blake Coleman trade for Tampa Bay. So uh, they wind up trading a prospect and a first-round pick to the Devils. Devils also get... Another prospect from the Islanders and a second round pick when they traded uh, the old Andy Green, Andy Green to the Islanders. But Blake Coleman to Tampa Bay. Uh, how does that help out the favorites right now at four to one to win the Stanley Cup? I mean, Coleman is a third line winger that can play top six, as we've seen, making only one point eight million dollars this year and next year. So he signed to a very reasonable contract, which is what Tampa Bay needed due to their cap situation. Uh, Coleman is excellent on the penalty kill. I believe, if I remember correctly, he's in the top five in terms of goals that come at a, come at even strength on five by five, which is something that we saw last year in the playoffs that Tampa Bay struggled to re- tremendously with. So you factor in what he's making, signed for another year, his role on the team, giving up the one and Nolan Foot is probably not an overpayment. Colorado was supposedly in the mix for him. They thought I think they thought they were getting him. Boston was supposedly in the mix for him. Um, Edmonton was supposedly in the mix for him. So Coleman had a tremendous amount of interest. And the Devils were going to have to get overpaid to a certain extent to move an asset that's making only $1.8 million this year and next. And what did you think about what the Devils did get back in return? Foot and, and the picks. 
Uh, foot getting foot, you know, is one of those guys that you figure should break should break into the roster probably in another year or so. Had a prominent role for Count on the World Juniors. Uh, fits probably a second or third pair type of forward, but you get him. He's a solid prospect. You get a number one pick, which goes on to the other picks you've gotten. I think they, I think they did very very well in terms of that trade in the green trade. I don't think any of us expected to get a second rounder for a guy whose contract's going to expire at the end of the year. But the Devils, with Adam Pellick out, needing a guy to pair across, associate with Ryan Pulak, needing a first or second line paired defenseman, a guy who can also play the penalty kill, and more importantly, be a veteran leader in the room, which they have to a certain extent, but they definitely can use another one. Um, it's probably not a big of an aberration giving up a second. I personally would have thought a third was probably fairer for him, um, but giving up a second, given the other intangibles that Green brings to the table, Probably push the third to a and second. And Scandella, another defenseman, goes to St. Louis from Montreal for a second and a fourth. Yeah, I think the fourth is conditional. But, I mean, St. Louis, with the unfortunate incident that happened with Jay Boomeister, was clearly in need of another blue liner. They got themselves a very solid one in Scandella. You look at it similar to what, uh, to what Green brought back, which was the second. I mean, the prospect giving up the two in the conditional four is probably right in the range for, for the type of player of Scandella. Maybe slightly high, but St. Louis also needed to import somebody fairly immediately, given that you knew that Boom Easter was going to miss the rest of the season. Okay, now let's uh, take a look around the injury landscape. We already mentioned a few players. Uh, let's, uh, we talked about some of these guys last week, nothing, that, and nothing has changed. Uh, let's talk about Colorado, though. Uh, because now, I mean, we, we, we already mentioned Kadri, who looks like he's going to be out another three to five, but Rantanen is going to miss weeks with an upper body, which is a big blow. And Grubauer, the goalie, the number one goalie's out for who knows how long. Yep, the best way to refer to Colorado right now is decimated. Uh, we talked about Kadri last week. Of course, I have Rantanen and Grubauer <laughs> in two of my fantasy leagues, so clearly I'm, I'm ecstatic oh, yeah. right now with their injuries. I mean, Ratnan missed time earlier in the season, and he had really gotten hot since returning. Um, it lengthened the lineup. We know that they've put the Rocky Mountain High line together every once in a while when they need a goal, which is Gabriel Landeskog, Nathan McKinnon, and Ratnan. Now with him out, um, that takes a major piece out of their out of their forward lineup. Uh, there's been enough rumors that they're interested in Kreider. Kreider's, Chris Kreider has been mentioned substantively. Um, they're clearly going to have to go get a forward if they're going to make a run. Goaltending-wise, um, I hear that Grubauer's injury may not be as bad as first thought, though there is no timetable. But the longer he's out, I mean, more of the burden falls on Pavel Francuz to be their number one. He's done a nice job of filling in. But Hunter Miska may not be the guy that they want to have as the number two, who they just recalled. So I would look for Colorado to maybe be aggressive in the goaltending market. So that's why a lot of rumors have centered around the Rangers. We know that they could end up moving Georgiev. There's been enough rumors that Henrik Lundqvist might potentially be on the block. Chris Kreider has been mentioned. Jesper Fasco has been mentioned. Ryan Strom has been mentioned. Um, there's a lot of connectivity between those two teams, potentially, in terms of a deal. Uh, but we'll see what happens by Monday. But Colorado clearly has to go out and find somebody, given the injuries, and two ma not, not just small injuries, but major injuries up front and also between Is the pipes. Is Kreider the biggest name out there right now as far as forwards? Uh, in terms Being bounced of around, rumors. guys who will be unrestricted free agents, yes. I mean, could there be guys who are signed longer term that could be on the marketplace? It's possible. But in terms of guys who are likely available, Kreider is by far the biggest name What about there. defensemen? Who, 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 with a bunch of defensemen gone this past week, who, who, who's at the top of the list right now that we can think of? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, again, I, the, the defensemen that were probably the biggest names were probably moved. Oh, besides I mean, I know, uh, Martinez, I mean, right? Ranger, Martinez the, might be... Uh... Right. Mar well, Martinez is rumored to potentially going to the Knights. I mean, that was the rumor that came out yesterday. I think Elliot Friedman said it. If, if Martinez is likely the biggest name, I mean, LA is clearly in a punt mode. right? so they're, they're going to move guys that make sense to move. So I wouldn't be shocked. Martinez is... If he's not gone by tonight, likely should be gone another day okay. or so. So, and he's a guy that has, as as unfortunately as a Ranger fan, I know all too well Stanley Cup experience and big Stanley Cup experience. Um, guy who can play probably your second pair blue liner. Um, the Devils. I mean, the other guy really that's probably most probably mentioned, who's also signed for term, so he doesn't have to go. Is Sammy Vatnin. Uh, if if somebody if if team is going to basically make a big play for a blue liner with Mar if Martinez is off the market as expected or or offers are coming in. Sammy Vatten is the other big name to look at to move come Monday. Yeah, matter of fact, they also added Vegas this week. I had them last week at 20 to 1. They're 16 to 1 this week. Uh, so I added, I added a half, 
half uh, of what I did last week on Vegas. I also put money on Boston again. Uh, so I got Boston, Washington, Philly, and Vegas this week uh, in my futures. Uh, who do you have this week? Um, I'm going 500 on Boston, um, especially as I think they're going to make a big move to get somebody. I'm going to put 500 on Tampa. I, I, I like the Coleman acquisition a lot. I think it lengthens their lineup. Um, going 500 on Washington based upon the acquisition of Dylan. Um, that's the other one I'll go for. And I'll go for 500 on Vegas just because I think they're going to get Martinez. And I think that Mark andre Fleury is finally starting slightly to round into, into better. So you're going to go with uh, 500 on Boston, Tampa, Washington, Vegas. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, uh, just wrapping up the injuries, uh, big blow for Edmonton. Clef bombs out two to three weeks with a shoulder injury. Uh, big injury. Clef has been, been eating a lot of minutes this year. He hasn't been as successful lately as he was earlier in the year, but he's been eating a ton of minutes. Um, with him being out and McDavid being out, those are two very big losses. Um, they've gotten really good goaltending out of Mike Smith. Um, Koskinen finally had a, Mika Koskinen had a good start the other day, but Smith has been really good uh, the last three, four weeks or so. So the, the burden now falls on Leon Dreisaitl. It falls on Ryan Nugent Hopkins and the guy who stepped up is Kaylor Yamamoto. But their lack of blue line depth was also one of those reasons why a Vatnin or a Martinez makes sense depending on what type of term and salary that has to be taken on and board. And by the way, besides Bezer out at least until the beginning of the playoffs and Furlan now out for the, uh, the until next year if he's ever going to be back with that concussion, uh, it looks like Josh Levo is also out now potentially also like Bezer until maybe the start of the playoffs. And then want to wrap up with a team that won't be going to the playoffs this year, San Jose. Uh, right after Hurdle should have won the MVP of the All-Star game and got robbed, he comes out, I think it was game two against Vancouver after the All-Star game. He injures his knee. He's out for the year. Uh, Couture had already been out with an ankle injury. Uh, and now Eric Carlson out for the year with a thumb injury. So it's if, if it's not it, – look, San Jose, do they make any kind of trades now that they officially know they're done? Is there anything they could do? And, or, or are they still going to try next year to become a relevant Stanley Cup contender? I think they're going to try to be relevant next year. Uh, and the guy that could move is Joe Thornton. Um, if they're going to move somebody because he's only signed to a one-year deal, if they want to try to get him a Stanley Cup, it's possible. Team looks to get Thornton as a third-line center. So that would be the guy I would look to move. I mean, they already moved Dylan, and so that's one guy they've already moved. I mean, with, with Vlasic, Burns, and Carlson tuck, sucking up a lot of cap room, it makes it difficult for them to move guys, and you have Couture and Hurdle. Um, so they, they've been decimated lately with injuries. They were, they were borderline playoff contenders, uh, but once all those injuries hit, they had no shot at which is why they pulled the plug and dealt Dylan, and why it wouldn't shock me if Joe Thornton gets moved by Monday's deadline. All right, Jan, appreciate it. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I haven't checked the schedule this week, but I'm looking forward to seeing the Detroit Red Wings on as many times as NBC can get them on. Hey, again. It's, it's, it, it, it's Chicago Rangers, I think. Oh, today. okay. Oh, that's right. And then after the game, they're going to have that Miracle on Ice special. I don't know if you're aware yep. of that. They, have, I think at 11:30, uh, right after the game, or maybe okay, I'll have maybe to, after overtime. I'll have, I'll have to watch it. I, I know they're doing something. I think on. I think Saturday afternoon on NHL Network at 4 o'clock they're doing something. Okay, I'll check that out then. Also for Miracle uh, at 4 o'clock, I think, on and Saturday. the deadline is on Monday, so that's a huge Monday day. Monday at 3 p.m. Huge day, of course. We'll hopefully be on the air next Tuesday. So that's our goal, to go over all the big deals. And best of luck to Kreider. You want him traded? with, And if you do trade him, what do you want? Well, A, no, I don't want him traded. I've been fairly fairly adamant for the last year or so that I actually want him extended and named the captain of this team. If he doesn't um, if he get traded, go, I, does that happen? Uh, yeah, okay. I think so. I think so, yes. I, but if he is traded, it's got to be a number one and a, pro, and a good prospect. An NHL-ready prospect also. Like somebody's top two prospect. Correct. And a number one. Correct. Top ten Correct. pick. Uh... Uh, it may not be top 10 based upon lottery who he's going pick, to, I right? Say. It may be, but it may not be a lottery okay. pick depending on who he okay. goes to, right? But it'll be a first rounder. Just the minimum. first rounder. That's all you're interested in, plus that top prospect. Well, yeah, plus the prospect. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's got to be okay. both. Okay, because the prospect probably got to be a better part of the deal then. Uh, 
probably yes, based upon where a team might pick. Yes, I mean if you look at the Rick Nash deal, um, when they got ended up getting Lindgren in the one, um, that's probably kind of one of those one of those guys. I mean it was also with Holden was part of the deal as a separate trade. It was Ryan Strom was part of that deal. So they did not they sorry Ryan Spooner time. They had guys who went back and forth in that deal. So there there'll be guys that they're going to try to get. But I think if they do make a move, it's going to be a number one. And and it's also going to have to be a prospect who's who's if not in the NHL, very much ready to join the NHL by next season, uh, because given the pipeline, they want guys who are ready sooner rather than later. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Thanks.